Well, good evening, and we're joined for lesson number four. And I'm Dana from Arts and Scraps, uh, also known as Mr. D. And I'll be facilitating this meeting. And we have uh, Patrick with us, who's going to be moderating. Um, and the first thing we'll do is go to our agenda so that we can see how this particular night is going to go. And uh, so we'll pull up the PowerPoint and we'll start with our icebreaker. And our icebreaker is the second thing on our agenda and discussing the agendas first, which is uh, greetings and introduction, and then the uh, icebreaker and that, and of course, into some discussion of what we're going to do and then the hands on. So uh, initially, I want to say that after you sign in while waiting for others to sign in, please post in your chat box. One thing that is true about you that you believe no one else in this group can claim to be true about themselves and the instructions will follow. So I'm gonna go ahead and chat mine. And I've been using the same chat for a bit because uh, uh, we haven't had opportunity to, to be challenged. All right, let's see, type message. And I'm gonna put my name first so that I'm, we all know who it is. And then my unique ability or experience to this group. Yeah. I can regulation rim. Oh, let me go back. I don't pass tense. Because right now, it's not going to happen. Things would go sideways real quickly if I tried to dunk a basketball at this stage of the game. So when you put your unique thing in your chat box and identify yourself, we'll look at them from first entry on down after everybody's here. And then we're going to decide if it is actually unique. And if what you said is unique about you is not actually unique, then you're challenged to come up with something else that's unique until you come up with something that is truly unique to you. So, give you a little time to do that. And then we would be discussing that um, and get to know a little bit about each other. Oh, I've got coffee. Bless you, bless you. Okay. So, uh, and while we're waiting for others to come in, a little bit about Arts and Scraps. Uh, we do have our website on, on uh, in this uh, PowerPoint, and it's real simple, artsandscraps.org. And it is a site that tells you all about Arts and Scraps, more than you ever want to know. Um, we essentially are an organization, nonprofit, that takes things that are uh, scheduled to be thrown away, trash. And it's treasure to us if it is clean, if it's really cool, and if it's safe for children to use. Now, if those three things are, are in existence, then we want that stuff and we put it to good use with thousands of hours of volunteers who turns those things into kits and we get attached challenges to them and we put them in front of children in all sorts of uh, locations, including our classroom uh, at our store or we go out wherever kids gather and they have fun and they learn. And that's what we're all about. So recycling is a big part of, of our philosophy. But go to the website, you'll get all you need to know. The other thing I'd like to do is talk a little bit about uh, housekeeping, which is that if you are uh, have background noises on that, we need you to mute. And if you throw a hand up, 
will know that you want to say something or uh, you may be responding to a question that I have. Um, if you need a bathroom break, just uh, unvideo yourself and step away and come back when you're finished. And uh, so that takes care of that. So we got the icebreaker. So let's talk now about, um, we'll go to the next screen, which is, uh, and we talked about arts and scraps. The scientific process and learning at home is our theme. So we're, we're saying that you can have fun uh, with, with challenges and also we can integrate the scientific process in, in those challenges that we do at home that are fun. And so it, it serves two purposes. We're getting kids ready to address the scientific process, which is a huge part of any science curriculum. Uh, and it can start from preschool. So real quickly and simplistically, uh, we first have a question. There's so many things that are happening around us in this world and, and our children are full of questions. And if it is a question that can be the answer can be ascertained by experimentation, then that's what we do. So it starts with a question, I wonder why, or can, or if, et cetera. And then there's a guess as to what the answer is. We call it a hypothesis in uh, the scientific process, but it's just a guess. Now that guess can be an informed guess, which means that after you have a question, it's uh, very easy to go out and jump on the internet and Google uh, information about what it is that you're concerned about. And that's, that's appropriate for um, answering questions. And many times you'll find that the question you have has already been answered and there's information out there. So, uh, and many times it's our prior knowledge that surrounds us and we can make a guess as to the answer to our question based on prior knowledge or getting a different additional information and and being informed and then from that point uh, we arrange an experiment we call it a scientific experiment that scientific experiment is unique in that we are testing for one variable only in other words, we want to know if I do this and this specific thing, will that have an effect on the outcome of whatever my question is? So it means that we have to have this controlled experiment where everything else is kept the same except for that one variable that I'm testing for. And that's what makes a scientific uh, experiment using a scientific process unique. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very, uh, objective test and uh, and with that we have to make observations so whatever happens while we're doing this this experiment we record it and so there's sometimes numbers there's measurements there's times there are observations of uh, well, I left out an R and I don't know if I can do anything about that now uh, but anyway uh, so we record the observations and generally we put them in a chart. We have these nice, wonderful boxes, which are great ways to organize information uh, so that we can uh, compare different uh, things that we observe. And then we turn it into graphs often because that gives us a visual representation. So. Uh, Organizing information in a chart or a data table, as it's called, is one way of getting everything uh, clear. And then we turn it into a graph so we can visually see the comparisons, and that helps an awful lot. And once we look at what we've got, we analyze it, the observations that we made. So we compare the numbers and we see if there's a significant effect on whatever we're observing based on uh, the data that we've collected. Uh, and uh, the conclusion is we go back to our guess and generally it's very simple. You say, yes, my guess was right according to what I observed or my data that I collected or no, um, 
it is it was incorrect, the guess that I made, or I don't know, it's inconclusive. And then that further leads you back to maybe making an additional experiment. So you cycle back in with another hypothesis or another guess, and you arrange another experiment that will give you greater clarity, and you go through the process again until you come to a conclusion. And if your hypothesis is disproved, that's just as valuable as your hypothesis, your guess being proven. Because in both instances, you have learned something. You have one more thing that, in the case of it not being uh, correct, you have one more thing that you can eliminate. There's an old adage about the light bulb, and uh, folks said that Edison had so many hundreds of mistakes, but actually there were hundreds of things that he was able to eliminate as a uh, proper conductor for the electricity for the light bulb until he came to the right one. So he was learning every single trial that he did to find a filament for the light bulb. So it's not a waste of time. And everything we know, essentially, we know because of the scientific process. And that's in social situations, that's in scientific situations, it's in financial situations. Uh, we learn by the preponderance of the evidence. We learn by looking at what happens. And if something happens often enough and exactly the same way, then we tend to say that there is a theory that that must be so. And it becomes sort of a universal truth until somebody proves that it doesn't happen that way based on that information. So that's how we learn. And when I was in high school teaching, the thing that very popular, and I said it before, is relationships. So we talked about relationships between the students, and then they all agreed that they learned whether or not a relationship was a good relationship or a caustic relationship based on making observations of behaviors with the person who they had relationship with. And, uh, and over time, you can build up a case for the strength of relationship based on the data that you collect. And enough said on that. So anyway, that's a scientific process. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at two experiences now that both uh, utilize this scientific process. The first one is going back to last week when we built those wonderful um, uh, button uh, vehicles. And there's a couple of them that I have. And if you look in my box, you can see uh, a couple more that I did. I have uh, this one here. That's a smaller button. And this is really just with a simple sheet of paper. And that's this one here. And then uh, this one here, I just used a square stick. And what's unique about this one as opposed to the other is, um, these back wheels of this one, I simply got a piece of uh, wire, coated wire, and I cut it and bent it and just stuck it in to the, uh, to the button and put it in that smaller uh, axle, and it's just sitting in there. And I thought, boy, that's a real quick and easy way to uh, get this done. I don't know how to hold up over multiple uh, testings, but it certainly is going fine now. So uh, if you were at that uh, last one, or if you get a chance, look it up, and then you can make a number of these cars, and that becomes the material that we use for this first investigation. So we're going to, in this case, uh, the button vehicle investigation, we're going to use the button vehicles and design a uh, SM stands for scientific method investigation. So uh, there's so many things that we can do, and we'll talk about them now. Uh, I got in my materials, I don't know that I put, yes, I did. I have a cereal box, and I also, I think I have, uh, I don't know if I put cardboard down or not, but cardboard should have been there in a cereal box. So. Um, since we have not powered 
these uh, button vehicles and we could power them with balloons or with uh, uh, even electrically power them, we could do rubber bands, et cetera. But we're gonna use gravity. So that means that we need a ramp. And that's why I said a cereal box. So the idea is that you can take the cereal box or any other uh, thing that's, uh, that has some height to it and you can take a piece of uh, flat cardboard or a uh, flat stock board that's stiff enough and you can make your ramp. And depending on what your investigation is, you may need one ramp. Uh, you may decide that the ramp, angle of the ramp is something that you wanna test, in which case you would have two ramps or maybe even three ramps. And you decide what that angle should be in order to give a difference to your trials, but not be so uh, obtuse, acute. So acute that your vehicle ends up at the bottom of the ramp actually crashing into uh, the ramp. And so I decided to just take cardboard and just quickly make a couple of ramps. And so I have a couple of pictures that I want to pull up and we can look at them. And I'm going to talk about what I did. So we know we're going to need a ramp, whether we, the ramp becomes our variable or not. So we have this ramp. And I took a straight piece of cardboard and that would be the one that's the tallest piece and it was eight and a half inches wide. I want it to be wide enough for my car and also to put up guardrail so that if my car was not steering correctly, it wouldn't crash off the side. I uh, also put brakes in the bottom so that it would be sort of a, a curve to getting on the flat surface as opposed to being a straight angle straight to the bottom. Because experience has taught me that that happens. Now, I wouldn't suggest that you show this to your child. If it's a child who's old enough to design their own ramp or figure out how to put a piece of cardboard and tape it onto a box or whatever stationary thing they have, um, let them experiment with the ramp design and figure it out. Now, I have to say for me, my first ramp was 11 inches high and it's a 24 inch straight with six inches of the curve and i decided to make another ramp half of that so it was five and a half inches high and 24 inches for the straight way and a six inches for that uh, curve and you'll see that the one that's shorter goes out a little bit longer than the other one but it's because the angle is higher, which makes, if it's the same length, then that upright makes it a little different. But that's what has to happen if we're gonna have this experiment that has everything else equal. So the length of the ramp had to remain equal. And the only thing that's different is I have a, a height and then I have twice the height. And if I was gonna go further, I might have three times the height uh, in another ram. But I think that would probably be too angular. It'd probably be easier for me to go uh, maybe a half of that half. So a two and a, and uh, instead of the two and a half, it would be two and three quarters, I think. Uh, and so that's, that's equal increments. And once I've decided on if I need one ramp or two, then I just construct it. These rare pieces are some uh, pieces we had at Arts and Scraps. You can use tape or glue or high glue, whatever you need. Uh, if you're going to take a straight piece of cardboard and put it on a box, then you just simply tape it on the top and, and that. Um, so once you have that done, then it's a, a matter of deciding, well, what am I gonna test for? Most children are interested in how fast or how far, and that's a nice one. So if you have one ramp, then if you have a variety of children together, then they can build their cars. And so the thing is who can build a car that travels 
either the fastest or that travels the furthest. And that's a simple experiment. So then it would be a matter of setting the ramp up, having it on a, a surface and the surface matters only in um, how far you want the car to go. So I have a carpeting situation uh, with, with my ramps. And so I don't expect my car to go very far. But the thing about it is every car that's going to be tested is going to be on the same carpeting. So I've eliminated the carpeting as a factor because all the carpeting is the same for every single model. I've eliminated uh, the variety in the heights because we're using the same ramp. So every ramp is the same height. Every ramp will be held at the top and released and allowed to roll and that's the same for every ramp the only thing that's different is the designs that the students come up with and once a number of different designs are done and i marked mine this morning with pennies i just simply put a penny down at the um, center of the the, the uh the uh, front tire as a marker and then I moved it off the raceway and put it over to the side. And that's how I marked each one. And the kids can put a piece of paper with the name on it to mark it, whatever you need to do. And then once they're all done, you can look at them and see uh, which cars went the furthest, which cars were, were less distance, or if it's speed, if you're timing it, which ones went the fastest and got to a point. And then you can look at the relationship between how the car was made and maybe come up to some conclusion about the style of the car. So a kid may say, I think my car is going to be the fastest because I have it aerodynamically designed and maybe they've got a nice narrow front and a wide back. Another person may say, I've got these huge buttons as tires and I think the larger the buttons are, the farther or the faster my car will go depending on what you're testing. So that becomes your hypothesis. And then once you look at all the different entries, it may truly be that uh, the smaller the tires were, the shorter the distance they traveled, or uh, it could be that the speed was greater because the tires were bigger. There could be a relationship there. And maybe there isn't a relationship there, but that's how you, and you document how far it went in a table, you document uh, how fast it went, if that's your variable, and then you can make a graph of it. And depending on the age group, uh, tables and graphs is part of their science curriculum and they know how to do that. But the point is they're having fun and they're also doing a critical uh, objective test uh, of some guests that they have. Now, some other things that can be done. You might want to test for uh, accuracy. Uh, you may decide to put a mark on the floor away from the ramp and challenge your child to build a car that stops closest to that mark. So they're not interested in distance now. They're interested in finding a way to slow it down or speed it up so that it consistently stops at that mark every time. And that becomes a challenge. So maybe there's some way of drag, putting drag on the car once they find that it goes too far uh, or uh, changing the size of the tires once they find that it doesn't go uh, far enough, changing how much weight is on the car, all those things becomes uh, different uh, tests that they can arrange uh, in order to see if their hypothesis for how to make it more accurate is, is right. And again, they're documenting each trial, making adjustments, and, uh, and retrying again until they get a repeatably uh, efficient car that stops at a particular point. There may be a situation with steering. Maybe you want the car to go down the ramp and yet go off to a certain spot and stop. And so that becomes a different kind of thing with steering. So uh, that can be done. And then in the case of having multiple ramps, you might wanna see what the relationship is between uh, how high the ramp is and how far the car goes. And if this were a high school situation, I would want some mathematical uh, proof of whether or not you have a, an arithmetic increase, if it's twice the height, 
than I expect it to go twice the distance. Uh, maybe it's a uh, algebraic uh, increase, or it could be a, an exponential. So it gets very critical depending on, you can get very involved depending on the age of the, of the ones who are doing the experiment. And then of course, that means you're doing uh, fancy calculations for, uh, for uh, what is it called? Error, the percent of error and all that. So there's, there's ways of engaging all age groups, or it just could simply be that you're dealing with elementary kids and they're just noticing that all the cars clustered that one higher ramp goes further than the ones that are on the lower ramp. And, uh, and that becomes a visual table. What I've also done is laid out uh, paper, just shelf paper, long roll, and let that be my, uh, my uh, route. It was part of the track. And then in that case, we just simply took a marker and we marked uh, a line and it was your color and then you initialed it so we knew that was yours. And we did it off of one ramp and then we did it off of a second higher ramp and maybe a third higher ramp, three times, two times, and one time. And then we could literally put it on the wall and compare the cluster of uh, trials for each of those uh, uh, ramp heights. And we could make some, some uh, observations and, and uh, interpret some results based on what we were actually looking at with that. So there's so many different ways that you can do this and, and uh, let the child decide to come up with a, a question that they want answered with their cars and, and let them set it up and go for it. So that's uh, pretty much an exhaustion of the button vehicle investigation. And um, so I think we'll go on to the um, cleaning pennies. So now with the cleaning pennies, this one I ran across it out on, uh, well, certainly I've done it in chemistry class and that. And uh, I think it's, pretty much common knowledge that if you drop a penny in a Coca-Cola, over time it disappears. You know, and there's that so caustic and so corrosive that it actually dissolves a penny. And so that's a nice one to do if you've got the time to wait for it to dissolve. Then the way, again, of doing a scientific investigation, and especially for those who have no experience with uh, any of the, the uh, common kinds of understandings about chemistry, it's a nice introduction into chemistry. And I have on my site uh, links to a couple of the experiences, but you can pull up others by Googling them, uh, cleaning pennies or polishing pennies, etc. And they have a number of already set up uh, experiences. I'm going to put this one up because I don't have the link to it. And this one is called the Spark Lab. And in all of these, what's happening is you're challenged to get some, some dull pennies, some older pennies that have uh, corrosion and that on them, discolored, they're not shiny and new. And you choose different uh, recommended liquids and then in some of them, they ask you to pick your own. I thought I would use coffee as my liquid, as my, my choice of a liquid, but they had in there, according to like the materials list that we have, lemon juice, cola, milk, vinegar, and salt or vinegar alone. Uh, there was, uh, what else? I think one of them had, uh, yeah, that one, the third one had orange juice and lemon juice. Um, any of the juices probably would be good. And so essentially what you're doing is you're setting up again a controlled experiment and it's controlled in that all the pennies should be old and dull. Um, you can do multiple trials with pennies in case some seem to be duller than others and, and you end up with a lot more data. 
and you get a uh, non-metallic container, and there's a reason why it shouldn't be metallic. If you get one and use it with some of these um, liquids, you'll find why we don't use a metallic container. So plastic cups are pretty much the uh, safe bed or glass. And you're going to make it controlled and that the amount of liquid is the same for every single uh, cup that you have. And you're going to have one penny in each one or two pennies or five pennies, whatever you decide the amount is going to be. And you want it to cover your pennies and you want to leave it in for a determined amount of time. And uh, counting to 10 or 10 seconds might be good. Uh, part of your experiment might be to see if not only how are different, how are pennies affected by different liquids, but it might be, is there a effect, a different effect on the pennies based on how long they stay in the liquid. And so those are all things that are up for consideration in making this controlled experiment, except, and, and it just has to be the same amount of time for each penny. So they recommend you doing it one at a time because if you put 10 solutions out and put 10 pennies in, and then you decide that you're gonna take the pennies out with the spoon that you have in your materials list, well, by the time you get to the 10th penny, it stayed in uh, 10 times, you know, a 10th, or 10 more, whatever it took for you to take it out, than the first penny. So you changed the amount of time it was sitting in. So if you put the penny in, put the liquid on, and wait the three seconds or 10 seconds or a minute, and then take it out and time it, and then put the next solution in, you're gonna keep it accurate because that's very critical. Because you may not know if it was a length of time it was in a solution, or if it was the solution itself, if you vary the amount of time that it's in there. And depending on the age of the kid, those are the kinds of questions you want to um, generate when you're doing the figuring out how we're gonna set up this, this uh, investigation. You wanna ask the kid, well, do you think that would matter? And can we say for sure that it's not the length of time because we changed the variable, et cetera? Uh, you might, be concerned about whether it's a Canadian penny or not. Uh, experiment might be to see if it happens with nickels the same way or quarters or dimes. You change the material that you're testing the effect on. And there's an interesting one that I came across I didn't think about was uh, when you leave uh, some of these solutions in a, uh, some of these pennies in a certain solution, it starts to break down the copper uh, copper oxide oxidates and it becomes part of the solution. And they suggested that you could take a nut and bolt and put it in that solution after you remove the penny and it actually would electroplate the copper onto that uh, uh, nut and bolt. So there's all kinds of things that you can kind of steer the kids to and let them try to figure it out. I wondered if 7-Up, I made a 7 my daughter's birthday was today so I made her a seven up pound cake and I thought uh, my wife says well we do have some um, diet cola in the, in the kitchen and so I was going to use diet cola but then I said you know what I think I'm going to use seven up too and let that be a solution and I have coffee uh, seven up and cola and see if there's a difference and then the other things that they suggested. And so it's just a matter of making observations, recording your observations, uh, doing what they say in the procedure and being careful we use a spoon because some of these things are caustic um, and rinsing it off as soon as you get it out because rinsing and clean it would stop whatever reaction is going on. So you wanna keep that consistent. Uh, and so there's uh, links to these different kinds of experiments and then you can do a recipe style what's there and then and, uh, some of them, they go into the science behind it, depending on the age of the kid. And they talk about acids and bases and all those kinds of things that are part of why these things happen. But if you don't need to go that far, that's fine. It's certainly sparked a, a question and a consideration and you've learned something and you uh, uh, went through the scientific process. And I can guarantee you that, that uh, 
every assessment test that has science in it, it's going to always ask you some question related to uh, how we how we how do we design experiences that gives us enough information to believe whatever it is that we're experimenting for and that whole body never goes wrong when they ask you to look at experience and decide if it's a valid one or not uh, when you address the matter of um, frequency so we believe what we believe because the same thing keeps happening over and over and over again so when they get this COVID thing des de designed and figured out they do testing and they do testing because it's going to take multiple variety of tests and getting the same results that are safe and effective before we decide that it's something that we want to market and so there are people in different nations who will take the same publication and results and they'll test that same thing in their own labs using the same conditions and see if they come up with the same result. And again, once we get a preponderance of the evidence based on repeated tests and repeated trials, then we have strength for what we believe. So I've told my kids, if you came up with that, it's not as powerful as every single one of the other 34 kids in this class coming up with the exact same result. And then if that's coordinated with some classroom across the world who's doing the same experience and they come up with the same results uh, when they set it up the same way you did, then we start believing that we have something that is true, that's, that's theoretically true. And it remains true until a, a uh, a happening happens that contradicts it. So gravity is true because uh, as far as uh, back to Newton and the apple, when you uh, take away all other effects on an apple, uh, it's going to go down when you release it from a certain distance or height. And we call that gravity. And the moment somebody steps off a high rise building, in the uh, absence of any high winds or any other effect and they float up instead of going down uh, until that happens we believe that gravity is a natural law so we have that theory in place and it's only when it's contradicted that we challenge it and we only make it a law when it's happened so many times that we began to believe that this must be the way things are. And again, that's the way we learn everything that we learn in the world, more or less through this process. It's sometimes informal, and sometimes it's very, very uh, objectively set up, but it all comes to the same thing. It's a preponderance of the evidence. And that's what we love about the scientific process. It's applicable to all of our lives. So that is the penny uh, shiny penny experience and I would challenge you to do these things with your children or do them yourself in, in anticipation of doing them with the kids and uh, there's so many offshoots for that too and so in this case most of this the variable is the solution uh, it's it's a matter of does different solutions uh, does different substances affect whether or not a penny comes out shiny or not, including liquid soap, uh, dishwater? Uh, it would be interesting to see what the results are. And if it's not going to be different liquids, then it could be the same liquid, but you leave it in for different lengths of time. So if I was going to do that, then my hypothesis would be the longer I leave my penny in orange juice, the cleaner and shinier it will be over time. And that would be my hypothesis. So in that case, my variable would be the length of time. So I don't have any other solution. I just have the, the one uh, orange juice, if that's what I said. And I have the same amount of orange juice in each one. And I have uh, equally dull pennies and the only thing I do is I leave the first penny in for maybe 30 seconds, a second penny in for a minute, the 
third went in for a minute and a half, the fourth went in for two minutes, uh, two minutes and a half, three minutes or however. And in each case, I take it out, clean it, rinse it, and then I compare them. And then I come up with whether or not my hypothesis is correct. But in this case, I'm not dealing with different solutions. I'm dealing with the time a single solution is uh, having an experience with my penny. So it's just so many different ways that you can set them up. But you got to remember, keep everything the same except for the thing you're testing for, that experimental variable. Everything else is controlled. And that pretty much is that. So if you go and uh, Google the scientific method, there's a lot more extensive talk on the uh, internet about all the things that are involved in the scientific method. They talk about quantifying uh, your results and what's significantly different in your results. They talk about, uh, again, getting prior knowledge together in your head or going and researching before you do things. Uh, when it's a competition scientific uh, fair, we call them science fairs, uh, you want to find something that nobody else has ever done. And there's a zillion things that nobody has ever tested for. You just have to come up with a, a experience that no one else has done if you want to be competitive in the upper grades. And once you do that and you either prove or disprove your hypothesis, either way, if it's a well set up and creative and innovative thing to look at, and it matters to people, because that's another one, you want to be searching out things that are, are of consequence. Some things we don't care. And so why even investigate it? So if it resonates with people, if it solves some problem, if it gives us some insight and it's never been experimented on before by anyone, then chances are you've got yourself a gold ribbon. And in Detroit, there used to be a trip to Toronto and uh, some kind of gift certificate, et cetera. And so uh, nothing else. Uh, you might have a scholarship to college, depending on how well you did. Ah. And I think I've exhausted that. So we'll look in the chat and see if anybody has any questions or comments or reservations. And if not, we're going to have our reflection. And our reflection, again, is a matter of going to the uh, chat box, putting your name in, and responding to the rose, the bud, or the thorn uh, in the chat box. And so what I would question of you is to chat, and you don't have to leave your name. If you want to, you can, but I would like the response to be public because we're all gonna save our chat to our computer so we can go in if anything else was said or any recommendation or something was done uh, to help someone else along the way, we've got that information. So the thorn is blank was challenging and I did not enjoy it or uh, blank was challenging or I did not enjoy it. And I did not enjoy or I did not enjoy it. And so you're thinking about if there's something thorny, you're gonna pick one of these at least and you can respond to all three if you want to. The bud would be, I'm going to try X, Y, Z. Maybe I'm gonna try the, uh, the wrap experience or I'm going to try the pen experience or I'm going to try it but I'm going to do this that or the other and that's uh, great for others to get ideas about how they might do it and then the rose is what you most enjoy what I most enjoyed was your melodic voice or that cool shirt you wear that we don't often get a chance to see which is my arts and scraps shirt you ought to see the back it is so cool anyway uh, once you've done that, you can uh, download the rest of the chat when everybody's finished. And then we're uh, off into our next cycle of these same lessons starting next week on Tuesday. And I'm looking forward to it. I may do a little something different, but essentially I'm going to be doing the same lessons. It just may be uh, certain little things that I decide to do differently because I now have information on how to make it more effective. And having said that, it is 7.52, so we're pretty good. And I want to bid you a good evening, the rest of the evening.
thank you for signing in and uh, I hope you come back for the other uh, in-home experiences. So, bye-bye.